Hello, everyone. I'm Michelle Pekansky Brock. I'm faculty mentor for CVC, which stands for California Virtual Campus and the online network of educators. We are funded by the California Community College System to increase access to high quality online education to students across our system. I am on the professional development team and our focus is improving teaching and learning with a focus on inclusion and equity. And that very much lends itself to today's uh, session. Again, this is the second in a longer series of humanize, humanizing um, that we started a couple of weeks ago. And so we're gonna be building on what we learned last time. And if you weren't here for that one, that's okay. You're gonna be just fine, no worries. So our agenda for today, we're going to start with a warm up, just like we did last time. These, these warm ups are really designed to increase self awareness, which is an important part of equity minded teaching. Um, and we also are hoping that they are going to give us some knowledge and skills to start to decenter white dominant culture, which was a focus from last time. So today's warm up will be focusing on unpacking per perfectionism. And um, then we'll be transitioning to the lean in portion, which is our presentation. And then like all of our, our 90 minute workshops, there will be a hands on portion. And in today's hands on portion, you will have an opportunity to get started on your humanized homepage. Um, I do wanna stress that our system does use Canvas as our learning management system. And so we will be focusing heavily on how to use Canvas to do this just in case there's anyone out there who's not a Canvas user. Um, and we do need you to be logged into a Canvas course, or if you're in our digital badge uh, cohort, then you'll wanna be logged into your sandbox for that portion. So just have that in mind as we get closer to it. Um, that will take place in separate um, Zoom rooms. We'll talk about that later. And then we'll be reconvening in the large room for our cool down, which will be a chance for you to share any takeaways or discussion items. Okay, so for our warm up today, um, we want to think a little bit about our last warm up. Um, our last warm up together, we reflected on the values of white dominant culture. And we talked a little bit about how hard those values are to see, how hard culture is to see um, the longer you've been immersed in it. And we wanna really aim to identify how these values influence the way we design and teach our classes. One of those values is perfectionism. And I can tell you that from my 12 plus years working with and supporting college professors in their teaching and learning, perfectionism is hands down one of the greatest cultural barriers that interferes with innovations in teaching from my perspective. Perfectionism leads to constant comparing of ourselves to others, and it prevents us from recognizing that we are good enough the way we are. It prevents us from looking back and recognizing our growth over time. It keeps us in a perpetual state of feeling inadequate, which is exhausting and dehumanizing. Building self-awareness of the influence of perfectionism in our lives can be empowering because once we see it and we can name it, we can start to push back on it. For today's warm up. I'd like to read a brief excerpt from a book titled The Book of Awakening by Mark Nepo. As I read, I invite you to close your eyes and focus on my words or focus on the image on your screen. I also invite you to change your body position to ensure you are comfortable. This is titled The Pain of Becoming. We do ourselves a great disservice by judging where we are in comparison to some final destination. This is one of the pains of aspiring to become something. The stage of development we are in is always seen against the imagined landscape of what we are striving for. So where we are, though closer all the time, is never quite enough. 
The simple rose at each moment of its slow blossoming is as open as it can be. And the same is true of our lives. In each stage of our unfolding, we are stretched as possible. For the human heart is quite slow to blossom and is only seen as lacking when compared to the imagined person we like to become. It helps to see ourselves as flowers, as a flower were to push, if a flower were to push itself to open faster, which it can't, it would tear. Yet we humans can and often do push ourselves. Often we tear in places no one can see. When we push ourselves to unfold faster or more deeply than is natural, we thwart ourselves. For nature takes time and most of our problems will stem from impatience. Perhaps one of the hardest remedies to accept for our pain of becoming is that wherever we are in our path, no matter how flawed or incomplete, is a blossoming unto itself. However much we've done at the end of the day is more than enough. So to close our warm up, we're gonna take two minutes of quiet time during which you are invited to quietly reflect on those words or write about what is resonating with you. All right, everyone. Um, thank you for leaning in for that warm up. We're going to continue to lean in and, and build on those thoughts that are resonating with you as we move forward, um, as we shift our focus a little bit from us to our students and um, engage. Oops, and that has the wrong title on it. We are talking today not about the liquid syllabus. We are talking today about a humanized course card and homepage. So let's get started with that portion. We could say that our goal for humanizing our online classes is to create a learning community. Now, usually in my discussions with faculty, when we talk about building community, one of the words that gets repeated quite frequently is engagement. So I want to unpack that word a little bit. Okay, so I've got some questions for you. I want you to think about when you're teaching an online class, what is it that you look for to identify if a student is engaged? 
and there's no wrong answers here, but I'd like you to add your response into our chat, please. When you think about engagement and teaching online, how do you know when students are engaged? They ask questions, clarifying questions, participation via chat, polls, speaking out, responding to discussion questions. So now we've got some, some different responses based upon whether or not we're talking about live online or asynchronous. Um, let's see, participation. So uh, yeah, a lot of participation, right? Time spent in the course asking questions, great. So a lot of themes are starting to emerge here, meaningful replies to classmates, a sense of authenticity or bringing their lives or world into interactions. Great, they're awake, <laughs> that's a good sign. They show up, yeah, and, and we wanna ask ourselves, right? Does showing up mean that someone is engaged, I think that's a really good question to unpack. Um, so some wonderful asking for thumbs up in the chat. So little check-ins, right? There can be smaller indications and maybe bigger indications as well. Lots of really interesting uh, responses here. Okay, thank you for that. I'm, I'm really noticing how many of them do um, reflect a live environment, which is, which is intriguing to me. Um, and now we're gonna ask another question. How do you know if a student is not engaged? They don't turn in the work. Someone said it's not easy to tell. No time spent in the online classroom, missed assignments, low page view, uh, crickets, cameras off, make a statement that, the, that is off topic, no participation, canned responses in discussions, they don't respond, cameras off, okay. So I'm not going to read through all of these because you do have them. Oh, they disappear. Okay. Um, you do have these to take a look at. Don't answer emails. Great, great, great. We want to really kind of unpack these very critically because really what you've just provided here um, are examples of what, what we use as teachers as data that we perceive as indicating engagement or not engagement. And engagement is such a big word to understand. And sometimes what we do is when we see cues of disengagement, we may make the assumption that the student isn't prioritizing the class or doesn't care or just not motivated, right? And focus our attention on the engaged students. Um, and so what I wanna do is, is kind of unpack things a little bit and, and spend a little bit more time with this. So a community is something that a person has to want to be part of. In order to want to be part of a community, a person must feel trusted and valued for who they are and what they bring to the table. From my experiences when faculty teach online, most of them want to build a learning community. They really like this idea and they're oftentimes skeptical that it can be done online or, or very curious to learn how to do it. Um, but in, in our practice, in our practices too, often we are taught to start with adding discussions or some other interactive activity into a course. Or worse, we are taught to interact with our students because it's a legal requirement. And that's not where we want to start this conversation. Community, as we already stated, starts with trust and belonging. Simply adding a discussion to a class, depending on many factors, could promote belonging for some students for sure. But for others who are starting your course from a place of distrust, it's not going to make progress for us. And I think what's important to recognize, again, is when we focus on trust, um, we need to notice that it starts with the very first click, right, when we're teaching online. And so we get to decide, first of all, when that first click is and what it looks like. 
And for many students, progressing towards a community, like trust, it's just kind of there and they, they, it's smooth flying for them. For other students, it's not so much. It looks more like this. Um, and for some students, you know, they completely drop off. And that's something we need to understand as a two-way street. Trust is mutual. Trust is something that we cannot assume that students start with when they enter a class. Um, the fact of the matter is that learning is a lot like an airplane taking flight. And every single student in your class has a different type of runway. Some students' runways are short, some are longer than others, some are straight, and some have twists and turns. And all of them are susceptible to change based on what's happening in a person's life. Because learning occurs at that intersection between thinking and feeling. As Antonio Damasio, a leading neuroscientist has said, we are not thinking machines, we are feeling machines that think. And Laura Rendon, whose scholarly work focuses on the access retention and graduation of low-income first-generation college students, has written about this in her book, Sente Pensante, Sensing Thinking Pedagogy. Rendon points out that indigenous cultures are often rooted in the concept of duality, which recognizes the need to nurture the whole self. Rendon's work helps us to understand that learning as we traditionally think about it in higher education is a socially constructed notion that stems out of white dominant culture. Acknowledging the role of feelings in learning decenters that white dominant culture and designing our classes that invite in and support and welcome feelings, right? And tries to cultivate a positive experience that empowers and validates our students that are otherwise left out. And supporting emotions and learning for that reason is a tenet of anti-racist teaching. I've got another quote here um, that some of you may know I love to share. It's one of my favorite ones. It's from neuroscientists Mary Helen Imordino Yang and Antonio Damasio. Emotions are not just messy toddlers in a china shop running around, breaking and obscuring delicate cognitive glassware. Instead, they're more like the shelves underlying the glassware. Without them, cognition has less support. In our first session with Claude Steele, we considered the detrimental effect of stereotype threat on intellectual performance. Stereotype threat is a type of cognitive underminer, a phrase used by Sia Versheldon in her book, Bandwidth Recovery. Cognitive underminers prevent students from, be, from performing to their full potential, what they're fully capable of. It blocks their ability to perform to their full potential. Imposter syndrome and belongingness and certainty are two more cognitive underminers that block a person's ability to do what they are capable of. So we considered how stereotype threat can result in lower test scores. It can also result in disengagement and sudden withdrawal from a class. Imposter syndrome causes a person to feel like a fraud, like they're unworthy of achievement. It can prevent a person from applying for promotion or trying something new. Belongingness and certainty is a very generalized experience that everyone experiences and is worsened by social isolation. And when we think about online classes, right, we're learning in social isolation unless we intentionally create that socialization. And the antidote to that is warm, encouraging invitations to connect with others. Becoming educated about and discussing imposter syndrome is shown to mitigate it and creating an identity safe environment and fostering growth mindset are two proven ways to mitigate stereotype threat. So everyone here is susceptible to the social psychological phenomenon, but research shows that they affect people from non-dominant identity groups more severely. And that's really important to keep in mind. So as online ed educators, when we view our Canvas dashboards and we see who's logged in, who's responded to a discussion, who submitted their assignments, which are all important things we need to do. 
We need to also look at those who have not done those things and recognize that while we may take these as cues of disengagement, we, they may be the result of cognitive underminers. There's likely a lot more going on there and you can change that, you can help that. Creating an environment where everyone belongs is where we must start to build community. And in case you weren't with us for our last session, I just wanna be very clear about what belonging is and what it isn't. Belonging is not the same as fitting in. Belonging is being accepted for your true authentic self. Fitting in is when a person has to change who they are to be accepted. And that comes from the work of Brene Brown, her book, Braving the Wilderness. Now, as educators who work in the California Community College system, we work in the largest system of higher education in the country. We serve 2.1 million students and two out of three of the students served in our system is a person of color. I wanna talk a little bit about data and keep that data point that I just mentioned in mind about who our students are. In the last distance education report that came out from our chancellor's office, we learned that the average online course success rate in 2016 to 17 was 66%. Now that's a data point that doesn't tell us a whole lot, but if we disaggregate that same data point and we look at it by race and ethnicity, this is what we see. That state average of 66% is represented by the horizontal bar. And we see that only our Asian and white students perform above that average. And our African-American or Black, American Indian, American Indian, Native American, Hispanic, and Pacific Islander students all perform below that rate. So we see that our students of color who are two thirds of the students we serve are disproportionately impacted in our online courses. Now these gaps exist face-to-face -face as well. I didn't have that data, so I couldn't show it, but I just want to be sure that's clear, but the gaps are bigger online. And I believe when we look at what the research shows about supporting uh, underrepresented students, we see that relationships and human connection Validation from an instructor is something that is a game changer. And so if we aren't really making that the priority of where we start in an online class, then that's contributing to these equity gaps. Closing equity gaps is our responsibility as California Community College educators. And it's one of the goals in our chancellor's vision for success. And doing so requires us to be race conscious, not colorblind, okay? So if we look at that data point 66% and leave it at that, that's colorblind. Disaggregating it by race and ethnicity, that's being color conscious. And you see how it opens new questions for us. This involves designing and teaching psychologically and socially inclusive online courses. And to be able to do so, we have to have knowledge of social psychology and culturally responsive pedagogy, and we need the digital fluencies to apply those concepts to our online classes. And these aren't things that faculty naturally possess, right? Nor are instructional designers, and I'm generalizing, that's not true of everyone, but for the most part, these are skills that we have to work together to learn and come together and prioritize them. And that is where professional development like the series that we are engaging in here can help. So thank you for being here. This fall into Humanized Online Teaching Series, um, we are developing elements for our online courses that serve as micro affirmations or cues of social inclusion. They're small and they build up over time. And they're particularly powerful for our students from minoritized groups. These micro affirmations are like marbles in our students metaphorical jar of trust. They're small and while they may feel insignificant and you may think, oh, that's not that important. It is because they build up and they accumulate over time, just like those jars that go in a marble jar. 
So the eight elements of humanized online teaching are laid out on the slide. Um, we're here today to dig into two and three, a humanized course card and a humanized homepage. These are research-based, like recipes for you to follow and adapt and make your own. And they're intended to be implemented with warm demand or pedagogy. That's really important to say. I don't want it to be the assumption that you just put some things in your class and you're done. The pedagogy is what allows us to critically interrogate our relationships with our students. And uh, we are gonna have a session later on in this series that will focus on that pedagogy. <clears throat> Um, Tracy has asked a great question. I want to address that. Um, Tracy has asked, what is the specific definition of course success rates in education? And that answer varies based upon where you work. The data that I showed you for the California Community College system, success rate is de defined by students who complete a course with an A, B, or C. That's what that data was looking at. Thanks for asking that, Tracy. And Helen, thanks for helping me manage those, those questions. I appreciate that. Okay, so when we approach our teaching, we obviously need to focus on what we do as instructors. But at the same time, we need to be centering our students' experiences. So not just thinking about what we're doing, but thinking about how what we do affects the way our students feel. And to do that, we need to know who our students are. That's an important part of this puzzle, and we'll actually be digging into that more in our next session. Um, and we need to think about how what we do affects all of our different types of students. One way can, we can do about this is to think about the flow of a course experience for students. We often think about a course starting on day one, but for students, just like for faculty, it actually starts way before that. The moment a student registers for your class, we could think of them as your student. They're thinking about what you are going to be like as an instructor. They're thinking about what your class is gonna be like. And in our first session, we considered how a liquid syllabus can be used as a kindness cue of social inclusion. A public, mobile friendly, beautiful website with a warm brief video and asset-based language sends a powerful cue to students. So ask yourselves, we talked about sending that liquid syllabus out a week before the class starts, which is a great strategy. But what about across the institution if those links could be made available in the class schedule so students could click on them and make more informed decisions about their classes? Something to think about. So in this session, we're building on that foundation. Okay, so we're thinking about this period here as our high opportunity zone for these cues, kindness cues of social inclusion. Last time we focused on that liquid syllabus, and this time we are focusing on week one and looking at a course card and a humanized homepage as two really powerful cues we can include. So what is a course card in Canvas? Well, it's that little icon that gets represented on a student's dashboard. And I'm just gonna play this super quick video. When a student logs into Canvas, they're taken to their dashboard where they see a course card for each one of their courses. A course card can be customized by the teacher of the course to include a customized photograph like the one on the left. Without the course card image, a course card appears like the one on the right. And students can change the color. Which course card looks more welcoming to you? So again, we're talking about a really subtle clue here and very low hanging fruit. But when a student it's logs very into interesting, folks, there is research that shows that these tiny little visual cues of inclusion matter in online classes. So there's a research study which Again, different context, but I think we can extrapolate here. This research was done in a MOOC, a large MOOC, which if you don't know, is a massive online course. It's, it's actually public and um, open to anyone to register in. In a research study, a gender inclusive image, like the one you see on the right up there, not the one on the left. So this is this was how the research was conducted. That gender inclusive image on an advertisement for a STEM MOOC or massive open online course 
increased the click-through rate among women, but not men, by 26%. So we know that women are underrepresented in STEM, and that underrepresentation contributes to their lack of interest in being in, of participating. And so it's, it's fascinating to see that significant change there. And in that same study, adding a gender inclusive course image and an inclusivity statement that basically said, everyone is welcome here and everyone can learn here. Adding that to the enrollment page raised the proportion of women enrolling in the STEM course by 18%. And that study included 63,000 people So when we think about our course cards and we keep those equity gaps in mind, right? So a lot of our students are doing fine. Closing equity gaps means really thinking critically about changes we can make to support our students who need something different. So including a cue of inclusion that cues students from one or more minoritized groups. And that's up to you to determine how, how that fits into the discipline that you teach can be something that contributes to this change towards an equitable online, I should say inclusive online learning experience that will lead us to closing those equity gaps. I'm not saying that this one thing alone is gonna do that, but it's, it's part of the puzzle. So adding a course card in Canvas is actually quite simple. And I have instructions here for you that I'm not gonna go through here, but I do wanna say one thing. When you look for your image for your course card, don't start with Google image search. Go to an image repository, like the links that we have on the screen. And this Canvas guide will walk you through how to search Unsplash, which is now actually linked into Canvas. Um, and if you can't find the image in Unsplash, check out some of the other resources that we have here and, and let us know if you have examples of other image repositories um, that represent images of diverse people. Okay, now um, let me check our Q&A here. So Janet is asking about the liquid syllabus. If I send it one week before the start of the class, do I need to send slash eliminate the welcome letter? So Janet, um, it's great to hear that you have the welcome letter included in your online teaching practice. And I think about the liquid syllabus as a more humanized welcome letter. So I think it's, um, I, I wouldn't say eliminate it. I would say that you're upgrading it by doing that. So yes, they, they do serve the same purpose. I hope that helps. Um, okay. So moving on, before we get to our homepage, I just want to touch upon some interesting research um, by Ambadi here. And this goes back decades. Uh, there is research that shows, and this has been repeated in many different contexts, including in education, that viewing a small selection of an interaction results in an accurate conclusion about the observed person's macro traits. And macro traits are described as liking the person, trusting the person, their competence, dominance, nervousness, warmth, likability, expressiveness, sympathy, and politeness. When this research was done, they actually used silent video clips. It was purely the nonverbal communications and the video that cued the, 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 the subjects about these things. And so in the research, they did a test after certain increments of watching the videos, and then they did research after a longer period of time actually engaging with the, the, the person or people. And the two were actually quite accurate. So one study showed that viewing a 30 second silent video clip of a professor actually accurately predicted the end of the term instructor evaluations. Now, there's lots of things we can do with that. Here's what I do with that. If we know that about the research, if we know that, then I see that as an opportunity to use brief videos in our liquid syllabus, on our homepage, in our course materials, super brief. I'm talking recorded with a smart, smartphone or a webcam, uploaded to YouTube or somewhere else and captioned. That is a powerful tool for closing equity gaps. 
So what is a humanized homepage? The goals of a humanized homepage, it should be visually pleasing. It should greet students with your warm human presence. And it doesn't have to start with a video, make that your stretch goal. Start with a casual photograph of yourself. Think beyond a professional headshot. It clearly guides students to their next step, provides relevant and concise information. And what do you find on a humanized homepage? A banner? with sufficient color contrast and alt text we need to bake in accessibility to this process accessibility can't be an add-on it's part of what we do to ensure all of our students are included a brief video with accurate captions or a friendly photograph of you a start here link that takes students to their first module which assumes you're using modules and I'm going to um, ask Helen about um, getting a link to the CVC OEI course design rubric. That was something I meant, I meant to add in here. For those of you who are just getting started with thinking about course design, there are a lot of assumptions that we're making here. Um, and so if you aren't familiar with the CVC OEI course design rubric, I want you to check out the link just open it up after Helen puts it in the chat and save it for later and know that it's a great resource to really guide you through um, getting started and helping you to understand um, course design. Yeah, so let me dig into Veronica's question here. Um, let me read it first. I'm concerned about reverse discrimination and far right individuals who may feel left out. I thought this class would be on humanizing online courses for all students. I did not realize that the main focus is on non-dominant groups. So our main focus here is closing equity gaps. So that's how we define equity in the system that we work in. And so what we're doing is looking to the data to see who is disproportionately impacted and looking to the research to see what practices we can implement to support those students towards success. And so that is the framework that we're working in here. So I hope that that addresses your question. I will also say that everything about humanizing is good practice for everyone. Everything about humanizing is good practice for everybody, but it has the potential to increase success rates for our students who are under our students of color who are underrepresented when we look at our data. Um, yeah, let's see if I have another question here. Okay. Um, thank you, Veronica. And I, thanks for acknowledging that, that it should be in the title. I think what you're getting at is that maybe our system needs to be more explicit about how we are defining equity. And I think that that's a, that's a really good point because um, I think I often hear that word used more than I have it actually unpacked and explained. And then I hear it unpacked and explained. All right, so how are we gonna do this? We have some great resources for you. We have developed two templates that you can adopt, and we're gonna show you how to do that. These are two different templates that you can import right into your Canvas course from the Canvas Commons. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you're gonna have an opportunity to learn. So you get to pick one of these, or you can start with a fresh clean page on your own if that's something you feel comfortable with. This is an overview of the steps, and you're gonna have some hands-on time to do these steps. The first step involves finding the template in Canvas Commons and importing it into your course. The second step involves creating your course banner in Canva, not Canvas, Canva. Unfortunately, they're very close in spelling. Canva is an online, free online graphic design tool that you can use to, to create a banner. And then step three is customizing your homepage. So it's putting all of your own content, it's making it your own adding your banner to your homepage with alt text and making it responsive, embedding your video or photo, editing the links on your homepage. And then step four is setting your homepage in Canvas to be sure that when students go into a course, they're gonna see it. 
So I'm going to, we have all these steps laid out for you in videos, folks. And in just a minute, we're going to let you. Hi there. We're going to let you pick one of these groups to go into. Okay, I'll go back to the slide in a second. Um, but if you want to get started with importing your template from Canvas Commons, you can join our group with Sean. I don't want you to go to these links right now. I'm going to click out of them. I shouldn't have done that yet. I'm confusing people. Let me do a quick demo so that you know what we're talking about when we say import from Commons, because I want you to choose your group mindfully. I am now in uh, Canvas on, a da on my dashboard in Canvas, okay? Over on the far left, this is called the Global Navigation Menu. There's a link for Commons. I'm gonna show you how to get to our templates. Click on Commons. I'm gonna do that again because I shoot, did it the wrong way. Let me go back to the dashboard. I wanna show you a little trick here. There's Commons. If you click Control on your keyboard and then click, you can choose open link in new tab. I always forget to do it, but if you don't do that, you lose your place in the, in your, where you are in Canvas. So I recommend doing that. So here's the commons. I'm gonna type in F-I-H-O-T, which stands for Fall into Humanized Online Teaching. And you should see homepage example one and homepage example two. So if I click on example two, if this is the one I wanna import, you can see a preview of it here to be sure it's the right one. And then I'm gonna click on import, download. And here is where you search for the course you want to import it into. So you need to know the name of that course. Mine is, um, I thought that was the name of my course. Hang on a second, Michelle PB, not coming up. Let's see if this is it. I hope I picked the right course there. And you'll see it says, you have successfully started the import. It may take a while to see changes in your course. So you go back to your course, which I believe this is the one I imported it into. And then you go, if, it, if it's a page you imported, you go to pages, view all pages, and there it is. So that's the one that I just imported, okay? So that's how that works. Um, and when it's in your course, you can then edit it. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. Um, the other option, let me show you Canva in case you're not sure what Canva is. I'm not going to do anything. I just want to show it to you. This is Canva in case you're more familiar with the interface than the name. And we're going to have a group that allows you to get started with doing um, setting up a banner in here. And what we're going to have you do is simply search for Canvas banner once you're in Canva. And that's going to take you to all these templates that you can use to get started. Now to use Canva, you need a free account. And we recommend setting up your account using your education email. And we have instructions on the slide um, that shows you how to do that to set up your education Canva account. If you choose an education account and use your EDU email, you'll get an upgraded account. So this is the deal. We've got four different groups. If you're in the digital badge cohort, we are going to meet in our own group. Okay, it's a pretty small group. So we're going to use the link at the bottom. And um, if you want to import your template from Canvas Commons, stay right here. You'll be working with Sean. If you want to create a banner in Canva, you'll have about 20 minutes to do that. Um, you can leave and go to the, the link for group two. And if you want to customize your homepage in Canvas, if you want to get started with that, um, Helen will be your guide. Sorry, Cheryl's the guide for group two. And we have a link for that room. You'll need to leave this room and go to the other room. We don't have breakout rooms in a webinar, sorry folks. And then we have the link below if you're in the digital badge cohort work group. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's the one that you had to pay $150 to be part of. 
Okay, so all of those links are now in the chat and I want you to go ahead and follow the path that leads you to where you want to be. And that means I am now going to leave and I Michelle, need to make Shawna, is Shawna host. Michelle, how are we going to know when to come back? Did you say um, a time? I didn't. Let's come back at 1145. 45. Okay. Okay. Um, and is Sean a host? I'm in as oh. a panelist. Let me see if I can upgrade him. Thank you. Where are you, Sean? Oh, oh and you know what? We need to copy these links before we leave the webinar. Sean, I'm not. Oh, never mind. Michelle needs to upgrade Sean. Yeah, I can't. Yeah. Okay. Uh oh. What? Am I? Oh, it just clicked on the link. Hold on. The reminder, I appreciate it. Let me back out of this. Okay, so I'm in a course and I'm going to show you how to um, actually let me go back to my dashboard and start with a course that doesn't have a. Let me go into this one. I don't know what this looks like. Okay. So I'm going to go from your course, you're going to go down on the left column in your course navigation menu and look for settings. So you're going to click settings. So Catherine, follow along with me. I'm going to show you how to create a course card in Canvas. A course card is an image. And right here, if you don't have a course card selected, it's going to look like this. And it's going to give you the option to choose an image. So I'm going to click there. Now you'll be prompted to upload an image from your computer, which you can do if that's what you want to do. Or you can go straight to Unsplash by clicking on the tab at the top that says Unsplash. Unsplash is an online image repository and all of the images there are shared for reuse, okay? And you can enter a word there, or I could do, I don't know why you'd want a picture of a birthday cake, but um, so I just selected one, I just clicked on it and that's how you choose your course card. Now, if we wanted to do something different, like right, we could look for people that way. And this is when, depending on the, the type of picture that you're looking for, um, it can be more difficult to find you know, folks who, who represent non-dominant groups sometimes, um, particularly adults. I find that as the pictures of adults get more prevalent, they're less diverse. Um, and when I say non-dominant groups, I'm thinking inclusively about inclusive uh, gender representations, people with disabilities, um, definitely thinking about uh, in, being inclusive there in terms of what we, we mean when we say non-dominant groups. Michelle, she mentioned, Catherine, that she was talking about in Canva, so we let her know oh. in chat, you, you can do it, but you have to know the size of the image, so you'd have to go figure out what the course card size is for Canvas. I, yeah, I just put it in chat, Helen, because we had okay. that question before, and it's in the slides, too, I think. Yeah. But the easiest thing is to just grab one, an existing image the way Michelle showed you and not stress about all the other stuff in Canvas, Canva. Yeah, so now that we have those dimensions in the chat for a course card in Canvas 262 by 146, if you wanted to do it here, you could go to create a design. Now I'm in Canva and choose custom size and then enter in your dimensions and select create new design. And then that would take you into um, the edit space where you could create your image.
So the banner size image that um, is recommended, I'm going to go back to Canva and just look and see what they have in there because those, those sizes actually work pretty well. That's a question that Patty has just asked. And I'll put it in the chat. One thousand by two fifty pixels. Yeah, I struggled with that along the way, Patty, too. So what is the HTML code so the banner will resize? That's a great question. Who asked that, David? Let me go ahead and show you how to do that. I don't know if I have this one set for, okay, this one is perfect example. So this is an image. And um, as you see, if my screen gets smaller, do you see how the, the image just kind of gets cut off, right? Do you want to share your screen? screen? Oh, <laughs> I can do that. But it was very descriptive. I could follow. <laughs> Well, that's good to know. So I'm here in Canvas and let me just show you, right? Students have all different size screens. Many look on, on mobile devices. And when you, you change the size of a screen, images don't always respond to that size. It can, they can just get cut off. And so there's a way you can, we use the phrase hack the code to make it responsive. I'm gonna show you how to do that. I'm gonna click on edit to edit this page. And now we need to go into the code, the HTML code side of the rich content editor. And to do that, I think there's a couple of different ways to do that. I click down here on those little two carrots that kind of look like that, carrots on their side. And this is our code. At the top, we're looking for the code for the image. So it's gonna start with, folks can see that, IMG. And you're looking for width, and height. Now, if you don't see width and height, sometimes it doesn't show up. You can toggle back over, click on that same icon at the bottom, the carrots, and switch to the rich text editor. And if you just grab the corner, click on the image and grab the corner and nudge it just ever so slightly, and then go back, then you'll see the, the width and the height. Um, so I'm going to change this. Here's what you, the answer to your question, um, David. You don't want it to show a number for the width. You want to just highlight the number, whatever that number is for width. Just the number, not the quotes, leave the quotes. Delete the number and replace it with 100%. One zero zero percent percent sign between the two quotes. So the image is still there. Recommend, I would also recommend deleting the um, height. Oh, around. really? Yeah. OK. You don't I just, I, I, it's just, yeah, make just I mean, take out the number. Take the whole thing out. Take height yeah. out. OK. I did not know that. And now we are going to save. And let's see what happens when I see when you change the, the size, how the banner is responsive, right? And the image below it is not. See the difference there? Yeah. So it's a, it's a subtle little tweak, but it's nice. It's a nice thing to do. Okay, any more questions? Raise, feel free to raise your hand. We've got about four minutes left. I'm happy to answer anything you might wanna ask. Clarissa, hi there. Hello, how are you? Such great information. All of you are so knowledgeable. Uh, I love it. And um, one question, I have a, um, I used an image online for my dashboard. But can I share my screen or no? 
Well, I'll show you. I'll turn my if I turn. No, you know the computer's not on. I have a, a something that says it's a fall picture that I got from the internet, but it it's giving me a color. It wants to assign it a color. So what I did is I try. It's like orange. I wanted it to be transparent. I can't turn the color thing on on Canvas. And then I have one for the summer, and it was a summer beach scene. And I wanted it to be the beach scene and it has teal. See, like that. Mm -hmm. So you're talking, you're talking, yeah. And that's not something you can change. That's, I find the most neutral one to select is the gray. The gray? Here's the thing. This is controlled at the user level. So you can set whatever color overlay you want there. How about if I don't want it? You can't take it off. And your students are going to control it at their local level. So whatever you pick is not what your students are going to see. Oh. So you have to kind of let that. Want a, I don't want a color. I, I, it, it does the three little dots. Ha, it, it doesn't. It, okay, it, I'm, it, I'm, hearing, I'm hearing different information that you can control it. Who wants the three to, dots across from dashboard? Okay, I've done that. Dots across from dashboard. At the top oh, here. Oh, I didn't know that either. Oh, Voila. that <laughs> is that new? Nope. No. No. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, they changed. They just changed it last week. That's help. That's really helpful. Oh my God, you are that a is, genius. Who is but that? It is Sean. Thank Sean. you, Sean. I, thank you. Am I correct oh. that it's still controlled at the local level? Though? That's correct. Yeah, that's yes. correct. Okay, so Love if it. we set it this way, does it? Does it? I assume it still defaults as a color. Yeah. Probably. Okay. Yeah, yeah Rand- Randy, I'm pretty happy to see that too. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. That, I that's all it. I needed. It's good. I've already learned a couple of new things here. It's great. Um, and. Uh, let's see here. We've got a question. There, there are two questions in the Q and A panel. Can you place an image at a specific location? Yeah, that's part of editing a page in in Canvas. Um, and working with images, it, it can get tricky. But any page in Canvas, you can add images to. Um, so actually, we have a, uh, we have instructions for that. I'm gonna I'm gonna point to a video because we're getting short on time. But if you go to the slides, um, slide 38, step 3A, add your banner with alt text to make it responsive. This video here is going to show you how to upload an image into a page how to add alt text to it, which allows for a a student using a screen reader to be able to read the image um, and make it responsive, which is what I just demoed a few minutes ago with the sizing. So that will help you there. Canvas also has great instructor guides that you can search and they show you how to do everything. Okay, so that's something that that, um, maybe we can uh, find a link to the guides for folks and put that in the chat. Which guide? Um, do Sorry, we have just a link? Questions. <laughs> do we have a link just to the guides in general that can be oh, searched? Oh yeah, I'll do that. Thank you, Cheryl. Cheryl got it. Um, so let's see. Thomas is asking: Is there any difference between uploading a banner image and uploading any other image? What if I just use the mountain button and upload an image with banner dimensions on top of the page? How is that different? It's the same thing. It's the same thing. Yeah, we're just giving the tutorials for folks who don't know how to do that already. Okay, great. Yeah, we can get you the link to the slides, no problem. And we are gonna be wrapping up now. So let me get the slides for you. Oh, there we go, Helen got it, Helen's quick. Thanks, Helen. Um, 
And we'll also have the slide link on the website when we get the archive up uh, next week. So if you lose them, you can always go there and get that link as well, okay? Um, I do wanna again say, I'm sorry for the hiccup that we had with, or some of you had, um, I hope some of you didn't have it, with the, the breakout rooms. Um, it, was a, it was a complex issue related to scheduling multiple rooms in the same account. Um, so anyway, we will definitely learn from that and carry it forward. Um, and thanks for your, your flexibility and your grace with us. And we're going to go ahead and wrap up.